All right, very good. Tonight we are continuing our study uh, on Mormonism, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, as it's called. And uh, so what we're going to do as we get started here, if you do not have the lesson sheet from last week, if you could raise your hand, please. Brother Todd will come down and he'll make sure you get one from last week because that's kind of the foundation for uh, what we'll be dealing with this evening. So we want to go and take care of that and then we'll review those things uh, quickly and make sure we have uh, all the information that we need for that and then we'll go into uh, the, new, the new material for today. And uh, so while we're passing those out and getting ready, uh, if you will please turn with me to the Gospel according to Matthew, Matthew chapter number 16. If you'll turn there as we're getting things ready. Matthew chapter number 16, and we'll read a uh, short portion of Scripture here to, uh, in, in a little bit, it'll be a little bit, then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll use that as one of our starting verses. So uh, that's part one we dealt with last week, and uh, then I'm going to keep Brother Todd on his, uh, on his toes there. Uh, we're going to go ahead and pass out part two as well, so we'll make sure we get that taken care of. So uh, he'll come as well with that on, on part two for tonight. Now while we're doing that, if you'll look with me at Matthew chapter 16, and uh, we'll begin reading verse 13. Matthew chapter 16 and verse number 13. Here the Bible says, When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets, he saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee, here's the key verse, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. And then notice this phraseology here. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, you may wonder how that has to do with Mormonism. And we'll find out in a little bit. But a couple of things that we, wanna, we do want to focus on. Christ, uh, pardon me, Peter makes this statement. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now, implied in that statement are some theological truths about being one God, the Father, and then Jesus Christ being His Son. Uh, and then he talks about the church and that the gates of hell will not prevail against them. We'll come back to that in a little bit. But I want us to pray together, and uh, let's just ask the Lord to open our hearts and minds, and then we'll review a little bit and go right in to the new material tonight. Let's begin with prayer, shall we? Our Father, we thank You for... Uh, once again, as we have already, uh, just the, the privilege that we have to be together. And we pray specifically tonight you would open our hearts and minds to the truths that we'll learn tonight. Uh, Lord, and help us to deal fairly and justly and uh, truthfully in all that we say. Uh, and Lord, give us understanding uh, in this matter as we deal with uh, the Mormon church and, and uh, th what they believe and things like that. I pray that you would lead and guide our, our uh, lesson time that would be helpful. Most of all, may it strengthen our faith and give us the equipment that we need to share the gospel with someone who does not know the true gospel of Jesus Christ. And help us to know the difference between the true gospel and then man's gospel. And I pray you would lead us in these things. I do pray once again that you would cleanse our minds, uh, free us from distractions, help us, Lord, just to take these moments uh, to listen and receive what you have for us tonight. Bless us in this way. We thank you for your love for us, your mercy, and your salvation, for the word of God that we have in our hands that we can believe and hold on to and upon which all of our faith and practice uh, can be based. And so for all that you'll do in our hearts, we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, what I would like to do as we begin tonight is uh, we'll begin with part one and we'll just review very quickly as a foundation, a starting point uh, in our study on Mormonism. Now, let me ask, uh, just as an introduction as we get into it, 
Is there anyone in this room that's ever had a Mormon come to your door? Okay, now I'm not talking about Jehovah's Witness because they're two different things. You have a Mormon come to your door, okay? We learned about uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses uh, last part of this study. We spent a few weeks on that. Mormonism is a, is a whole different thing. But let me give you just these brief things by way of introduction. We, we talked about the, some statistics uh, that how many are in the world, how many are in the United States, about 6.7 million in the United States. Uh, Mormons are scattered across the world. And then we did deal with a very, very brief history of Mormonism. We're going to go into more detail on that a little bit later. Uh, started by Joseph Smith in 1830, a man from New York who claimed to have received a vision of God and then a uh, revelation was given to him on the golden plates. This is a religion that spread uh, to the west from New York to Ohio, Missouri, Illinois, and so on, and ultimately Utah. Now, a very important question that we asked was, is Mormonism a cult, a C-U-L-T? Is Mormonism a cult? Now, instead of just answering that flatly, uh, we want to actually find out what is the definition of a cult. Now remember, there's a difference between cult and occult. Those two separate things, cult, C-U-L-T, occult, or occult would be O-C-C-U-L-T. Those are separate things. But the C-U-L-T is Mormonism, a cult. And uh, what we did was we dealt with the major elements of a cult to determine if Mormonism falls in line with those things. Now, the first thing that we mentioned was that a cult will normally be centrally focused around the teachings of one man. Centrally focused around the teachings of one man. Now, we found that with Jehovah's Witnesses, right? That they were centered on the teachings of Jesus. Anybody remember the name of that man? Anybody want to take a jab at it? Charles Taze Russell. Uh, he was not only the founder of that organization, but also basically the one upon whom all of the doctrines are based in Jehovah's Witness uh, ideology and in their belief system. So one defining characteristic of a cult is that it's focused on one man. And by the way, this could happen anywhere, really. You could have this characteristic even in other churches and other organizations where they end up repudiating the Bible and instead listening to one man. And so that's what, what happens here in Mormonism. Joseph Smith is, is the one and his successors who they're listening to. Number two was that uh, in a cult, one man will claim to either be a prophet of God or to speak in the place of God. And this is exactly what Joseph Smith did because he claimed to be God's prophet and he also claimed to be speaking, actually inspired by God as he supposedly translated these golden plates, and to be speaking in God's place, and therefore the things that he said were just as good, if not better, than the Bible. And those are things that he himself said. And so we will find that in, in, in cultic organizations, in cultic churches, if we want to call them that, Someone will claim to be a prophet or to speak in the place of God. Now, I just I wanted to mention real briefly that if you do have a question or something in the middle of the lesson, just raise your hand and, and we'll try to deal with it. If it's something that you want to ask right uh, then and there, that, that's okay. We've done that some and it's worked okay. And then uh, the third thing is that the leader of a cult will claim to have received new revelation from God new revelation. He will not just say, God told me this, and then you can look at the Bible and find it in there. But the leader of a cult will say that he has new revelation. In other words, something that has not previously been revealed. He'll say, I have new revelation, and you'll find that in cults, that new revelation contradicts what the Bible already says. And then number four, uh, the revelation usually is given in what? Secret, right. And this really is a hallmark of cults, honestly, because um, we deal with Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormonism, Mormonism uh, Islam even. Uh, all of those have this fundamental common denominator that whoever their prophet was, whether it's Joseph Smith or Muhammad or someone else, whoever that prophet was, 
they received that new revelation in secret. And when something is given supposedly in secret, as we said last week, it's very hard to falsify that. Because if no one was around to really see it, how do you disprove that this is true? And it's very hard to disprove it, and people end up falling for those things. But this is something to, to watch out for, something, uh, and this could permeate even other types of organizations, other types of people, where they'll say, oh, God showed this to me. He showed it to me. No one else heard it, really, but, but God showed it to me. And we find this defining characteristic. And then number five was that many times followers are kept from the truth by shunning them. Those who leave the faith or from keeping vital information from them. We talked a lot about that with Jehovah's Witnesses, that people who leave the faith are disfellowshipped. Remember that? They're disfellowshipped. They're shamed. In other words, they, uh, actually, uh, a Jehovah's Witness is really not even supposed to look at, at a former Jehovah's Witness. He's not even supposed to entertain them or speak to them. Uh, now, in Mormonism, uh, as I've studied a little bit more, um, it, it does seem to me that they're very similar in the sense that, really, if you, if you leave the Mormon faith, then, then there are a lot of consequences, eternal consequences for that. Um, and really, you can be disowned by family. Uh, you, you can be called an antichrist by those in leadership and things like that. Those things have happened. Those in leadership will, will call you names and things like that and say that you're of the devil and, and so on if, if you leave that, that uh, particular organization. So those, those are very across the board when it comes to cultic faiths, is that usually they'll shame those who leave, but also they'll keep vital information. Because why is that? I heard somebody, uh, I heard somebody give this illustration. He said, why, why would they keep uh, vital information? It would be kind of like, um, if you went to the doctor, you went to the doctor, and that doctor knew you had cancer, now what kind of doctor would he be if he didn't tell you? He didn't tell you anything about it. Now, if he doesn't tell you, you can just keep living on the way you are, but then you'll never know that there needs to be something fixed and something wrong. And uh, what happens in these cultic faiths is that a lot of things are, are kept from them so that they don't know that something is wrong. They don't have the vital information because the truth of the matter is, this is, I, as someone said it this way, I, I, I'm, I'm definitely entertaining the thought of it, I think it's true, that it's actually a legal tactic. Now, what do I mean by that? When you go into a court of law, whenever there's a lawyer def who is supposed to be speaking for this defendant, the truth of the matter is that that lawyer, if he could actually defend the defendant and know that he's guilty, but still say he's innocent, all right? Now, how does he do that? How does a lawyer do that? By keeping himself from the evidence so that he doesn't know the evidence that convicts that person. So in the same way, when we deal with these kind of faiths, if you keep the evidence from them, then they'll never know that something's wrong. And so actually, as we said, Jehovah's Witnesses are not supposed to look at anything that's not from the watchtower, Mormons are not supposed to look at anything that's anti-Mormon. Um, they're just not supposed to look at it. And why is that? Because there's too much evidence, okay? There, it's too easy, too much evidence to show false prophecies, false beliefs, contradictions, uh, not only against the Bible, but within the Book of the Mormon and the many corrections that were made, and then the incongruity between the different scriptures that they have. So information will be kept from that. And then a sixth thing, uh, was that it denies, a cult will deny key doctrines or teachings of Christianity while still claiming to be Christian. Now, I'm going to not give, I'm not going to spoil it because we're going to go into that at a future lesson. We'll talk about beliefs of Mormons. But let me just say this about Mormons, that even the most fundamental doctrines that we hold in, like a one true God and Jesus Christ, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and the Trinity, even those things they utterly deny. Even if they will maybe say to your face, oh, we believe in God the Father, we believe in God the Son, that kind of thing, or in Jesus Christ as our Savior, they'll use those words. They'll use the words that we use. But the problem is, I heard somebody say it this way, that they have the same vocabulary, but a different dictionary. The same vocabulary, but a different dictionary. They can talk about the Savior, they can talk about Jesus Christ, they can talk about God the Father, 
But it doesn't actually mean what we mean when we say those things. So even the most fundamental, the most fundamental doctrines of Christianity uh, are not only lacking, but actually denied in Mormonism. We'll, we'll talk more about it, but this is, this is a, a very prevalent uh, between all of the cults, is that they will claim, if they're a Christian, so to speak, cult, now there may be some that are not at all Christian, but those who claim to be Christian, they will always be denying the deity of Christ, they'll be denying the, the tenets of the faith, but still call themselves Christian. And that's a great danger, because they can speak in such a way where a person will say, oh, well, they're a Christian. They must know what they're talking about. They've received some new revelation. And so then people become susceptible and vulnerable to that kind of stuff. It's actually pretty amazing to me, uh, as I've studied uh, just a little bit about the history of the church uh, of, of the Latter-day Saints. And in the first year or so, they had 16,000 followers. Um, and so it was this rapidly expanding religion, and Joseph Smith being a very... Uh, just, just a dynamic personality, a, a good teacher, uh, a, a great leader, and things like that. People just followed him and listened to what he said. So this is, this is very key, that they will deny the doctrines and tenets of Christianity while still claiming to be Christian. And then uh, the last thing we said in order to define a cult would be that it diminishes or compromises in other words, take something away or add something, compromises the person and work of Christ and the sufficiency of his death for salvation. So it diminishes or compromises the person or and or, most of the time both, the person, who Christ is, and the work, what he did. Who he is and what he did, and then the sufficiency of what he's done. Do you remember how the Bible teaches us that when Christ was on the cross, remember some of the last words he said, those three words, it is finished. It is finished. In these cultic religions, organizations, they will want to add something to the finished work of Christ. So they want to talk about what we can do rather than what's been done. So all of these cultic organizations and religions are works-based, all right? They're works-based. In other words, they merit their own salvation. It's not been accomplished by Christ, and then they receive that sacrifice and atonement, but instead they themselves believe that they can gain and earn merit. And so there's going to be a system of works and things like that, and Mormonism certainly has that. And they will almost always, every cult that I know of, um, I'm not familiar with a whole host of them, but the ones I do, and especially these well-known ones, they do deny the deity of Christ. Uh, no doubt about that. All right, are there any questions on part one um, that need to be dealt with before we go to part two? All right, just wanted to make sure I gave you the opportunity if you did have anything there. Okay, so part two, let's get right into that. Uh, what I want to do with part two is I want to talk some about who Joseph Smith was that will end up being important, and then I will want to look at some verses that We'll compare what Joseph Smith claimed with what the Word of God says, um, and then we'll talk a little about the history of the church as well. So, who was Joseph Smith? Well, as I said earlier, uh, he was a very dynamic personality. Uh, he was someone who uh, really, as a young man, uh, his mother you know, said that he was given to periodic uh, meditation, and he was, a, he was a thinker, you know, he thought, he was a very mild-natured young man, he, you know, he was, he, was, he was just kind of that nature, the type of person that he was. But let me just remind you, or, or maybe you didn't know this, I just recently knew it, that Joseph Smith was only 14 years old when he received his first vision. 14 years old. So if you think about it, really this whole religion is based on someone who received, uh, purportedly received uh, two visions and received golden plates before the age of 20. So he had the vision when he was 14, uh, supposedly translated uh, those when he was about, like I said, less than, only three years later. So he's, what, 17 years old or so. So Joseph Smith was a young man in Palmyra, New York, who sought God, supposedly, for what church to be part of. So what happens here is that there was, there was I'm going to try not to get into too much detail so I won't get too laborious about it, but really, in that region that Joseph Smith grew up in, 
in that area of New York, there was a heightened interest in spiritual things and religious activities. There was revivals and things going on. And so Joseph Smith began to ask himself the question, well, which church should I be part of? Should I go to the Baptist church? Should I go to the Methodist church? Should I be a Catholic? What should I do? And so um, in 1820, he allegedly uh, he went into the woods. He went into the woods to pray and ask God, supposedly based on James 1.5, that says that if any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, that give us to all men liberally. And so he wanted wisdom, so he so supposedly goes out into the trees. Uh, he prays and asks God for wisdom. And then he was visited with his heavenly vision in 1820, and he was visited by two personages. That's the way it's said in Mormon, the Mormon church. He was visited by two personages, and they identified themselves as God, the Heavenly Father. One said he was the Heavenly Father. I don't know if he said God, the Heavenly Father. But one said he was the Heavenly Father, and the other one said that he was the Son, Jesus Christ. And the father said, this is my beloved son, hear him. This is what he uh, supposedly sees. We'll deal with that in, in a little bit. This is in 1820. And then later in 1823, now I don't know what all took place between those years, but in 1823 he was supposedly visited by the angel Moroni. Uh, in 1823, uh, where this angel told Smith, that there were golden plates located not far from where he lived, and that he needed to go find those golden plates because on those golden plates was contained the everlasting gospel. And uh, in fact, what I failed to mention was that when he was first visited by the two personages in his first vision, they said, the answer to your question is all the churches are an abomination. All the churches. Don't join any of them. All right? They're all an abomination. Now, we're going to talk about that a little bit. Is that even possible for that to be the case? Well, we'll talk about that in a little bit. And then, after he receives uh, the vision about the golden plates by this angel Moroni, uh, he goes and he retrieves these plates. And then, in 18, between the years of 1827 and 1829, he supposedly translated these plates. Now, here's where it gets real strange, all right? Real interesting. Um, and, and, and almost becomes obvious that this is a cult. Because he, he translated these u, using these interpreters, uh, two, two devices actually. One was a seer stone, okay? A seer stone. Now this may be, may be new to you, you may not have heard of it before. But basically what it is, is, is it, it's, a, it's, a, it, it's an occultish practice where you take, where he would take a stone and he would divine through that to read something. Uh, it's, not, it's not a biblical practice at all. Uh, Joseph Smith was involved in the occult. His family was, and he also uh, was a frequent glass looker, okay, which is basically someone who would, uh, like a fortune teller, who would look in, the, in a glass to try to get a message, all right? So supposedly he, he finds these plates, and then they are, they are supposedly had this ancient, reformed Egyptian language on them. This is what he says he found. He finds this reformed Egyptian, this is what the church claims, and that he translated it using these, these glasses that he called the Urim and Thummim. Now, how many of you have ever heard that phrase before? Okay? Not, not very many, just a couple of you. So let me explain what that is. In the Old Testament, the priest would wear a breastplate, um, and on that breastplate, they had two stones that were supposed to be used to basically inquire of God and give direction, things like that. And it was called the Urim and Thummim. And that was the name, basically the name that was given to those, uh, those, those stones that would help them, that God given them, that would help them to, um, to, to get a message from God. And so on these plates, there was this supposedly this everlasting gospel and from that, he translated the Book of Mormon. Now, the Book of Mormon, as we read it, we'll find uh, over the years, there was thousands of corrections done in it. It was changed and changed and changed and changed. Uh, and the question would always be in the beginning, if this was from God, why are we changing it? Uh, why are we changing it again and again and again when, when there's some policy change or something different? 
Um, and, and so Joseph Smith himself was not, was not, um, was really not well learned or educated. Um, and so he claims to, to just by himself, without really any proof, he just claims that these things that I found, this is, this is what it says. Now, Joseph Smith, uh, uh, growing up, was a man who was involved in treasure hunting. He was always in it, trying to find things, and as I said, involved in um, you know, the occult and that kind of stuff. And so what we want to do is we want to say, all right, well, if, if he has translated the Book of Mormon from these golden plates, let's find out, let's compare the Book of Mormon to the Word of God, and we say, could this be from God or not? And we can find an answer to that question. Could this be from God or not? The things that, that he supposedly received from God. Now, here's what I want to do. I want to look at a couple verses um, that go right along with what Joseph Smith claimed um, that he had seen um, and, and those that were with him, that, uh, what he had seen and, and then what he had uh, translated. Yeah, Brother Todd. No, I don't know. Again, like the golden plates, I, the actual evidence of them existing, I, I don't know. I'm sure they've, they've come up with something. I mean, they've had a hard time trying to reproduce like his stones that he used and things like that. Uh, I don't know of them being anywhere in existence. I don't know of them being in the Mormon temple. I don't know of them being anywhere in existence. Yeah. Well, yeah, and that's a good point. You know, um, that's a good point. Where are these? said golden plates. Um, and the way that he translated was really just kind of kind of kind of random. Um, and, and there wasn't really proof. I mean, see here's the thing. Let me just say this, all right? What in the world is reformed Egyptian? You see what I mean? When you talk about this kind of stuff, there's not a scholar in the world who could even translate such a thing. So what that does, it means he can claim anything he wants, all right? He can claim anything he wants. Oh, this is Reformed Egyptian. Okay. So now you can just sit there and tell me what it says, and I'll believe you because I'm never going to be able to translate it myself. See, that's, that's, that's what we're dealing with. We're dealing with something where somebody's claiming something that you have a hard time actually saying that's not true because you don't know. And he's translating these words by himself through this seer stone. He's translating these things by himself and claiming that this is some reformed ancient Egyptian uh, kind of uh, writing, and then he dictates what it actually says. So now we, we can't prove or disprove that, other than obviously evidence that the Book of Mormon is, has faults in it, other than obviously evidence that these kind of languages, um, a lot of this stuff maybe didn't even exist. So, so we have a lot of evidence against it, but at the same time, if someone makes a statement like that, it's kind of like if I said to you, all right, last night I woke up at 3 a.m. in the morning, I looked outside, and I saw a giant fuzzy pink elephant. All right? And, yeah, and you would look at me and say, you saw what? A fuzzy pink elephant. And you say, well, no, you didn't. Elephants don't live around here. I say, were you there? Were you there? Maybe, maybe he broke out of the zoo. Maybe he broke out of somebody's house. See? I mean, and then you say, well, let, let me go to your house. Show me where he is. Oh, sorry, he's gone. He walked away. See? So I, I, I can make anything up. Or I could find an ancient coin or an ancient whatever with all these characters on it that you can't read. And I say, because here's what happened. Now, listen very carefully. Here's, here's what Joseph Smith claimed, all right, about the golden plates. He said they were translated by the gift of God. So what does that mean? Nobody else can do what I did because I can translate from this reformed ancient Egyptian language. I can, I can translate it even though I have no understanding or knowledge in any foreign languages. I, have it, I haven't even hardly been to school, don't know a lot. But I can translate it because I have the gift of God and God gave me the ability. So... When you say that kind of stuff, all you have to do is convince people to believe you. You don't have to sit there and prove it. All you have to do is convince people to believe you. And so 
you can claim almost anything you want. Um, that's something you saw. You know, people talk about dreams they had. And, you know, you can't sit there and say you didn't have the dream because I wasn't there. I didn't see it happen. Um, and so we have the same type of thing. And so what I'm trying to help us all just to see is that this is the same thing we have in every other cult. Joseph Smith, what he, you know, he claimed to receive a vision. Muhammad claimed to, you know, and, and there's always some golden plate or something they receive or whatever. And, and then they come up with this book, right? The Quran. The Book of Mormon. By the way, what does the word Mormon even mean? I still don't know. I still haven't got an answer to that. What does the word even mean? All right, a lot of it's made up. Honestly, I'm getting ahead of myself, but we'll learn how it's just, it's, it's a made up fairy tale is what it is. And the more we study it, the more we see it, the more we'll, we'll, we'll understand that. So let me, yes. Right. Yeah. Yes. Right. And I appreciate you saying that because remember how Jesus said there will be false Christ. You know, honestly, Joseph Smith said some extremely audacious things. He actually said, he said, I, I have been able to, to uh, keep a church together. Neither Paul, neither Peter, nor Jesus could do it. He said, I've been able to keep my followers together longer than Jesus did. That's documented that he said that. And so it's a false Christ. Someone who says, um, I'm getting ahead of myself, but I'm just going to say it because it's, it's all together. But uh, I think it was Brigham Young, his successor, that said, the only way a person can be saved is by confessing that Jesus Christ is Lord and that Joseph Smith is a prophet. And that's how you can be saved. So... Like Miss Nancy pointed out, you know, that's something that can happen anywhere that people can say. And what they will do is they will deceive gullible people. They'll deceive people who don't know. Remember Ephesians 4 talks about people being carried about with every wind of doctrine. All right. And that's what happens. People who don't know, they're not firm in their scriptures. They're not grounded in the Bible. They hear this stuff. Oh, it must be the, the case. And we have, and honestly... We have the same thing going on today in a sense because there are people getting up on the stage and saying, God told me this, this is going to happen. It's not in the Bible, but people will believe it um, because people don't have the knowledge and the foundation and the groundwork to know that it has to agree with the Bible. So that's really what we want to do, right? If we want to test Mormonism, we have to test it against what the Bible says and say, okay, if it agrees with the Bible, it could be true. If it disagrees with the Bible, we have to scrap it because it disagrees with what God has already revealed. Now, remember, the Bible teaches us that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, revelation can be progressive, which means that he can progress over time, and he can give revelation that doesn't contradict but builds on itself. For example, uh, Jesus Christ was not revealed in the Old Testament clearly. The Messiah was talked about, the Son of David, and all those things. But the name Jesus Christ and who he would be and the, actual, and the cross, those things were not clearly revealed. Now, Isaac, it says he received him in a figure, or excuse me, Abraham received him in a figure and so on. So they knew some things about him, but he was not fully disclosed until the New Testament. So there's progression in Revelation, but God doesn't contradict. He didn't say in the Old Testament that one person's a Savior, and then in the New Testament say somebody else is a Savior. So, But when we come to the Book of Mormon and the Bible, we'll find that they're mutually incompatible because they disagree uh, about salvation, disagree about Christ, disagree about even who God is. And then because of that very reason, we can say, well, let's test it for what God has already revealed. Because if it's disagreeing with it, then God is not the same yesterday, today, and forever. So we have to test it against the Bible. Now, let me, uh, now let's look at a few verses that will relate, I believe, uh, specifically to the supposed visions that he had and some different things that go along with it. So we're in Matthew chapter 16. Now Peter said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. 
Now, that is an important statement because he says that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God, and it, what that does is identify who Christ is. But we're not going to spend time on that. What I do want you to see is in verse 18 that the Lord Jesus said to Peter, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Okay? Why is that important? And actually, this was not my own idea, someone else's idea, who was a former, uh, former Mormon, pointed out that what Joseph Smith supposedly received in that vision was that all the churches are an abomination. Now listen to this. He said, the, you know, the, the personages there that spoke to him said, ever since the time of the apostles, the church has been in apostasy. All right? So basically, we had the apostles, the 12 apostles. They died, and then immediately, basically, the church went into an apostate condition for 1,700 years. So that would mean that you're either in the apostles' age, you can have the true gospel, or skip 1,700 years, or you're Joseph Smith or some one of his followers, and you can have the everlasting gospel. So what it does, it, it leaves this whole gap between the apostles and 1820, 1823, and say, okay, so there's basically no Christian, there's no true Christians in that time. They're all apostates. Now, this is a crazy claim, but what does the Bible say? It says the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, I believe that's important because Jesus is not only saying that in the end the devil will be uh, placed in a lake of fire and the bride of Christ will be joined with him. He's not just saying that, but because Jesus Christ is the head of the church, no man is the head of the church, but since Jesus Christ is the head of the church, he said, even in uh, the time, in all of time, until Christ returns, the gates of hell cannot prevail against the church. So if the church is in a, in a condition of apostasy for 1,700 years, that means the gates of hell did prevail against that church for 1,700 years. So again, this is, this is so very um, typical of cults to say, hey, look, everybody's been wrong for hundreds and thousands of years. Everybody's been wrong. And I just now found out the truth, all right? And that's what, you know, Charles Taze Russell had a similar, similar type of thing. Oh, the church is all bad. Everything's all bad. And if you want the truth, you got to listen to me, all right? So now all you got to do is convince gullible people to follow you, to say, hey, listen, everybody's been wrong all these years. And I'm sure people went after that because they're like, oh, yeah, there's a lot of problems in the church. There's a lot of division things going on in the church. Oh, oh, yeah, that must be true, that there's no good church. And so then they follow him. So this is a tactic of those in the cult to say, hey, listen, the church has been in apostasy all these years, and now this is the only way. Miss Alice? Yes. Yeah. No matter how bad the world gets, there will always be a remnant. There will always be a true group of believers until Christ returns. Otherwise, who's he going to take with him? Right. There's always going to be the church. See, if the church came and went, in other words, let's say the church existed in the time of the apostles, and then it just disappeared over all these years. Well, what happened to the bride of Christ? What happened to the bride of Christ? Was she in dormancy? For all these years, you know, what happened to the bride of Christ? But, but in all of the Bible, you find that there's always a remnant of people. It could be small remnant, but when Christ returns, there's going to be a group. You know, the Bible talks about him taking them up uh, to meet him in the air. So there's going to be a remnant of people, and there always is a remnant. Even in Israel, remember? I just saw a little bit ago. How, remember, remember in Israel where... Uh, Elijah said, you know, I'm discouraged, you know, everyone's against me, there's no one left, and what did the Lord say? There's 7,000 who still have not bowed the knee to Baal. So there's always a remnant, always. And in the New Testament, we find the same thing. That's what the very New Testament is for. It's for the church until Christ comes. Uh, otherwise, you know, why would Paul speak that way and say, you know, be prepared for Christ to come, be looking for his return, because there's always going to be believers there who are always... Uh, when Christ comes and leading up to that. See, and another thing to mention, in the book of Revelation, we have Revelation 
chapters um, 2 and 3 that speak of the seven churches, remember? The seven churches. And, and a lot of scholars, uh, I should say commentators, a lot of commentators believe that that speaks of church ages. So Ephesus, Philadelphia, Thyatira, Sardis, and so on and so forth, Laodicea, is all a church age. In other words, these are types of these different ages of the church until Christ returns, and then ultimately in the end he returns. And so uh, what that does is it shows that there's always a church. There's always a church of some kind that's on this earth. The church will never be apostate completely. Now, Jesus said the love of many will wax cold. The love of many will wax cold. But he never said the whole church will wax cold. He never said there will be no church. He never said that. The Lord would come before that time, before he takes the church with him. So, so there's no evidence in the Bible whatsoever that would, that would indicate that somehow there's going to be a time of complete apostasy uh, of the church. So I think that uh, we can look at Scripture and say that this is a claim that's refutable. But then uh, turn the page over and, and see that, remember Joseph Smith said, he said, I saw two personages. That was the way it was put. I saw two personages, one being the Father, the Heavenly Father, and Jesus Christ. Now, if you really think about it, this is an outlandish claim because he has just claimed something that no one in the Bible ever saw. No one in the Bible ever saw. Even the disciples of Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration didn't see God the Father. Even Moses, the friend of God who spoke face to face, as it were, he never actually saw God. He never actually saw the face of God. But here Joseph Smith claims, oh, I just went out into the woods and prayed, and here God the Father showed up to me and God the Son. Or, or, or the Son, I should say. So what are some verses on this? Turn quickly, John chapter 1. Look at John chapter 1 uh, in verse number 18. Here's a very clear verse on this. John 1 verse 18. No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son which is in the bosom of the Father, He hath declared Him. Now the Book of Mormon has a translation that's all botched when it comes to that. But He has not seen God. No man has seen God at any time. In other words, you cannot see God and live. All right? Remember the, the, the mountain where Moses was? He said, make sure they don't come up and gaze because they'll perish. And because no one can look on God and live. No man has seen God at any time. Now, 1 John, flip quickly to 1 John chapter uh, 4. We have a similar verse. 1 John 4 verse 12. No man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwells in us and His love is perfected in us. So for a person to claim that they actually saw God is the most, it's the most, the craziest claim anybody could ever make. I could say I see anything, but to say I saw God is to claim something that no one in history has ever seen and no one in the Bible that wrote the Bible had ever seen. And uh, so immediately this whole vision is, uh, can be debunked because we know it's not true that he did not see God the Father. Now, he could have had a dream. He could have certainly had a dream. And in the dream, he, he, saw, he saw what he thought was God the Father, God the Son. How many of you have ever had a dream before about like the rapture happening or something? Anybody? You had like a dream about that? And you, or you thought you, were, you had a dream about what you thought heaven looked like, whatever. Well, we all know when we wake up that that's not really how it is. That's just something that we fabricated in our mind. And so in the same way, Joseph Smith claims to see something, but we know from Scripture he did not see God the Father and God the Son. Okay? Now, another important verse for this, because remember he said that the angel Moroni, which, by the way, I don't know where he gets that name. I think he just made it up, you know? Uh, yeah, <laughs> macaroni, I don't know. But Galatians, notice Galatians chapter 1. We've looked at this before. we looked at this before, but let's look at it again. Galatians chapter 1, because you say, okay, well, Joseph Smith claimed to see God the Father, he claimed to see the Son, and he claimed to see some type of angel who spoke to him and told him about these golden plates. Now, what does it say in Galatians chapter 1 and verse 6? 
The Apostle Paul says, I marvel that you're so soon removed from him that calleth you into the grace of Christ. Now, notice that phrase. Into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Now, just pause for a moment. Every other gospel is not a gospel of grace. It's a gospel of works. But he says, I marvel that you have laid aside the gospel of grace, the grace of Christ, and you have turned to another gospel. Now, verse 7, which is not another, but there are some that would trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. In other words, he's saying there really is no, no any other gospel, but there are perversions of the gospel. There are those who distort and twist the gospel. Then he says in verse 8, but though we, or notice this, underline this, or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you, then that we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Remember the Bible tells us in one of the Corinthians, it says that Satan can transform himself into a what? An angel of light. And so can his followers. And then he says, and don't be dismayed if his followers themselves will look like angels of light. And so he said, listen, I almost think as he wrote this, he knew about the Mormons, right? Because he said, look, there's going to be people who are going to claim that they saw an angel from heaven, from heaven, that's important, that will say that he came to me and he gave me, the Mormons call it, now if you're taking notes, write this down because it's not on the paper, the restored gospel. That's what they call it, the restored gospel. Because we lost it. We lost it over all these many years. And so he says this angel came from heaven and called Moroni, whatever that means, and he gave me this everlasting gospel. But what does the Bible say? If anybody, it doesn't matter if it's an angel, curse, it doesn't matter who it is, let him be accursed. It says in verse 9, As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel, I don't know how you can get any more clearer than that, unto you than that you have received, let him be accursed. Any other gospel, any other gospel, if any man preach any other gospel, the Book of Mormon and the beliefs of the Mormon church are another gospel because they take what Christ has done on the cross, they add things to that, they change who God is, they change who God the Son is, and God the Holy Spirit. Uh, they change all these things. They change the very fundamental doctrines of the Bible and then call it the restored gospel. Do you see it? It's just so clear that exactly what the Bible said, this is exactly what we're dealing with. Now, then also notice that we ask the question, and we'll, we'll, we'll just give it a couple more minutes, we'll wrap this up. Here's a question. Is Holy Scripture discovered in secret, or is it ever discovered where it's only discernible by one man? Okay? So is it ever discovered in secret, and some, it's the ground somewhere where, where an angel says, go dig this up and find it, or is it ever discovered where it's only discernible by one man. In other words, there's not a group of people who say, yes, this should be translated this way or anything like that, but one man just translated himself. Well, look at, look at this, look at this. Uh, uh, Second Peter, we're familiar with it, but I just want us to lay our eyes on it again because I think we'll see how clearly, just how clearly this lines up uh, to what we're dealing with. Second Peter chapter 1, notice uh, he says in verse 19, he had just talked about the Mount of Transfiguration experience and that glorious sight that he beheld. And then he says, hey, look, verse 19, we have also a more sure word of prophecy. So he's actually saying, this is very important, I have something that I can believe and trust in more than my experience when I saw that on Mount Transfiguration. And it's the very word of God. So what's more trustworthy than anything Joseph, Joseph Smith claimed to see? The Word of God. Because he said this is a more sure word. Because anybody can say they experience anything. And Peter experienced something amazing. But he says, and it was true what he experienced. But we have a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn, the day star rise in your hearts. Wonderful verse. We'll, we'll deal with that. Right now, we don't have that time, but verse 20. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. Notice that word. Underline it, bold it, write it. Private. 
What does that mean? If something's private, okay, something's private, how much money's in my wallet or something? Private? Not much, anyway. <laughs> All right? What does that mean? It means nobody knows about it except me. No one's supposed to know about it. Private means that it's hidden or concealed. And so here Joseph Smith says, I am the only one who can read these plates. I'm the only one. It's a private interpretation. Now, this is so easy to see. A private interpretation because when he looks at that ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics or whatever it is, he looks at it and says, I'm the only one who can what? Interpret it. I'm the only one who can discern this. Private interpretation. Private interpretation. Oh, so perfectly explaining it. Verse 21, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, the holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Now notice a couple things about that. He said it didn't come by the will of man. When Joseph Smith reads these supposed golden plates, it could easily come by the will of man because he can say whatever he wants because nobody's there to prove it or disprove it. So he could say the will of man. But then he said, holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. You know what that means? They weren't reading something and dictating it. They were actually speaking through the power of God, God giving them the words. That was the Holy Spirit inspiring it. He didn't inspire the golden plates, but he inspired through those men as they spake the very words of God. So, can Scripture be discovered in secret? No, it will not be discovered in secret, nor discernible only by one man. Then let's look at one final verse, okay? One final verse. Well, two verses together. For, uh, Revelation, please, chapter 22. Revelation, great, great verse to, to end this on. Will inspiration be given outside of Scripture? That's the question, because Joseph Smith claimed to be inspired. He actually produced what was called the inspired version. That's what he called it. All right? And... Uh, so could that be possible? Could there be inspiration on top of or apart from or outside of the words of Scripture? Notice Revelation chapter 22. You're very familiar with it, but just look at it. Verse 18. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things the prophecy of this book. Hey, listen. It doesn't matter if that's talking about the whole Bible or the book of Revelation. It's still the same. God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from these word, the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. So what does he say right here? He says, if any man adds to what's been revealed or takes away from it, he said, God is going to take his part of the book of life. God, that person, that person is speaking of his own will and outside of what God has said. And he's actually changing or added to God's word. And the Bible says in the book of Proverbs, add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. Don't add to it. Don't take away from it. And so he's saying, look, the canon of Scripture has been closed. The canon of Scripture has been closed. And this Scripture that we hold in our hands, that God has given to us, is a very revealed, inspired Word of God, and anything that someone says comes from God, outside of that, we can immediately say, this is not from God. This is not from God. And so, will inspiration be given outside of Scripture? No, not any true inspiration. Now, Joseph Smith could have felt inspired to say these words and everything, but not inspired by the Holy Spirit of God. Now, as I close uh, this lesson out, um, I think we can just finish, just kind of read through the rest of the sheet here. I don't want to have to come back and spend extra time on it. Uh, history of the LDS Church. Uh, Smith and his followers, they moved from Kirtland, Ohio. Basically, they started in New York, went to Ohio, and then from there... Uh, after founding the church, Joseph Smith claimed, I think I mentioned this before, that the kingdom of God would come in Independence, Missouri. And by the way, apparently he claimed that the Garden of Eden was in Independence, Missouri, but anyway. So that's where God would come. That's where Christ would come, in Independence, Missouri. Okay? Then his followers were subsequently expelled from that region. So they're in Independence, they're in that region. And then they had a conflict with the authorities and everything, not only because of lawlessness, but actually uh, it was worse than that. There, I mean, violence really took place. Um, 
between, on both sides. And eventually they had to leave. Uh, they had to leave Independence, Missouri. They go to Nauvoo, Illinois, where Joseph Smith actually founded that city, Nauvoo, which still exists today. And uh, they had the same problem there, all right? And I've read things where they said that there was crime, high crime during that time, and when the Mormons left, it was, you know, all that stuff got better. So they were actually causing problems uh, with the society and with the government. But let me just say this. Joseph Smith, uh, he died in a, in a jail in Carthage, Illinois. And Carthage, Illinois exists today, northern, kind of northern Illinois. And he died in a jail. And why was he in jail? He was in jail. Uh, he was on trial for treason uh, because of... Uh, things that he had done, and uh, there was a big problem with, a, with a, a newspaper in that town and things that were said about him and things he said and so on. And so there was an angry mob that just came in the jail. Actually, there was a guards, what I read, there was guards around the jail, and uh, they were supposed to be protecting Joseph Smith, uh, but they actually let the people in. The mob came in and shot him multiple times, and he eventually fell out of the window and, and died. Whether he died by the shots or the falling, either way, uh, he, was, he was killed. He was killed by an angry mob. Now, I'm not rejoicing about that. I'm just telling you the way it happened. And he was killed by an angry mob. And not because he was a martyr. That's what just what I want to make clear. He was not a martyr. And the, and the Mormons will say that you know, Joseph Smith's a martyr. But he was not. He was actually on trial for treason. Not for religion or... You know, he was a very political man. Did you know that Joseph Smith... I know I'm, I'm over, but we're stopping two minutes. Remember, did you know that Joseph Smith was a, a candidate for president of the United States um, back in the 1800s? He was actually a candidate for president. Uh, he didn't really get the nomination, but he at least tried. And uh, so he was politically involved. He had all kind, other kinds of things he was involved in. So he was not in jail because of his beliefs. That's not why he was in jail. He was in jail for treason. Um, so he was not a martyr. The Mormons then had to leave that area. They eventually migrated to Utah under the leadership of Brigham Young. And then, uh, we won't spend time on this, but the Mormons did execute violence uh, against a caravan of people. If you've ever read anything about the Mormons, you may have heard about the Mountain Meadows Massacre in 1857. Uh, and, uh, and so they were defending themselves against who they thought were going to harm them. And they just killed people, men, women, children, all that kind of stuff. Uh, now, I'm not saying Mormons are that way. I'm just saying these are things that happen in the history of the church. And because really Brigham Young and, and those, uh, those, those leaders really said, you know, you can defend yourself, you can kill if you have to. I mean, that's honestly, you know, what, what they said. Um, and so I gave you some verses there that you can read on your own time about how Jesus said that if my, if my kingdom is of this world, then would my servants fight. But my servants don't fight because my kingdom is not of this world. And so the Christians, true Christians, don't, don't fight their way to get their rights which is what the Mormons were doing at that time. Um, that's not the Christian way. So let me close with this final statement that when we look at Deuteronomy 18 that we've looked at before, what does it say is the test of a false prophet? If the things that he says doesn't come to pass, then you know he's false. And Joseph Smith said the kingdom of God's coming in Independence, Missouri. He said there's supposed to be a, a temple built there in a certain amount of time and all these kind of things. These prophecies did not come to pass. And because of that, we can, with confidence, we can say, he is not a prophet of God. He is not a prophet of God. Whatever these plates, things that he said and found and so on, we know they're in contradiction to Scripture, which we'll learn about that later, and his prophecies did not come to pass, so we know he's not a prophet of God. Um, so that's clear, I think, as, as we look at Scripture, uh, we look at that test of a prophet. If what he says doesn't come to pass, don't be afraid of him. Don't be afraid of him. And uh, in the Old Testament, they, they, they took care of those prophets. They, you know, it was pretty serious. So uh, I find him to be a false prophet. Uh, I know we're a little after today, but uh, does anybody have any questions, comments, uh, as we close everything? Ms. Nancy. Yeah. Yeah, honestly, uh, the Mormon church, you know, is still thriving. Um, and, uh, you know, it's just amazing the deception. It really is. And uh, so I think this underlines how important it is that we, we share the gospel with people because there's people who are so deceived. Brother Tyler? Yeah, Yeah.
Yeah. And what was the reference on that? Yep. Yeah, that's a perfect, that's a good reference for that, uh, where he says, no man can see me and live. So he would not be alive to tell it if he did see it. Miss Alice? Right. Yeah, there's that very, very, very interesting story in the Bible where it says that he saw his back parts. And, uh, uh, yeah, and uh, wow, what an amazing thing to see that glory. But he did not see his face. No man can see my face and live. Very important. Okay, any, any final thoughts, questions, comments? Uh, <clears throat> I, uh, I, I, I'm enjoying it. I hate to kind of say it that way. I'm enjoying the discussion. Uh, I'm not enjoying you know, thinking about the lies that people do believe, but they need to be told the truth. So we have that responsibility. Uh, let's close in prayer, okay? And uh, thank you for your attention, and uh, good, good discussion today. Let's pray.